Welcome to Prolific Figures, presented by the United States Air Force Academy Way of Life Alumni Group. WOL places special emphasis on diversity and ensuring the success of future and current cadets and alumni. On this platform, we will engage with influential black alumni who will share their perspectives on life before, during, and after USAFA. Join us on a journey of fruitful conversation and the celebration of USAFA's black prolific figures. Welcome back, family, to Prolific Figures, fruitful conversation with influential Black USAFA alumni. You already know who I am, Tyler Jackson, but today I want to get straight to our guest, all right? Now, you all know that some occupations are more demanding than others. You can imagine the amount of time it would take to become an airline pilot or a qualified lawyer. Now, consider doing both simultaneously while also building an award-winning business and overseeing a state agency for the governor at the same time. Well, today our guest, Captain William T. Thompson, did just that. He has also served and chaired on numerous business and nonprofit boards, more recently as past president and CEO of the Association of Graduates of the United States Air Force Academy, which represents its 50,000 graduates. A magazine once wrote of Captain T, he seems to make attaining the American dream look easy. The dream is possible, says Captain T, by following some simple principles and developing a commitment to do the best you can to live a life of excellence. Featured in numerous media, including the Wall Street Journal, Black Enterprise Magazine, NBC, CBS, and PBS, just to name a few. Please join me in welcoming Captain William T. Thompson as he takes us on the flight to excellence, which is the title of his new book. Captain T, what's going on, sir? Oh, it is a pleasure to be with you, my friend. Absolutely a pleasure. And uh, I'm honored and humbled to be on your show. Yes, sir. Absolutely. This was a um, this was a highly anticipated interview. I'm so blessed to be able to sit on this camera with you and have a good conversation. And I know our audience is going to reap the benefits of it. So, well, I know we got a lot to discuss, so let's get right into it. So, you ready? Let's get into it. All right, let's do it. Let's warm you up with some cookout questions. All right, okay. so got one for you. What is one thing that you enjoyed as a youth that you still enjoy today? Reading. That's mm. easy. I okay. went to Catholic school and I was always in trouble. I used to hate PTA day because I knew when my parents came home, I was going to be uh, in the doghouse. And what they discovered at a relatively early age was that uh, when I finished my work, which I generally finished quicker than the other students in my class, I was getting bored. So I'd start talking to my neighbors in class, which uh, at a Catholic school was being called disruptive in class. Mm -hmm. Now in the scheme of things, that ain't that big a deal, right? It's not right, like right. I'm up a little girl's dress or something. Yeah. But uh, so what they did was they took the priest's office, the father had an office in the school that he, that he didn't, uh, he didn't attend too often because he's over at the church. But they uh, made me a little library in the school, in his mm -hmm. office. And when I finished my work, I had to get up out of class and go down the hall to the priest's office and read until uh, the nun would come get me after she finished that segment with the class and bring me back into class. Uh, and I got to the point reading those books. I used to read uh, Nancy Drew mysteries and hardy boys yeah and and i'd be at a good part and the nun would show up and tell me it was time to go back to class i'd get back to class man i'd rush through my work so i could get back to the library and, <laughs> and read my books yeah yeah and, and so that uh, that one year i read 87 books they they kept uh a, a, a total you know tally that's the word i'm looking for kept yes. a tally of it mm -hmm. and um and made a big deal of it uh, at the end of the school year. I got a little award for having read so many books on top of all my classwork that I had done that year. Right. That is something that has stuck with me over the years. I love to read novels, self-help books, mm -hmm. um, pretty much any genre that uh, that is interesting. Good. Well, speaking of getting in trouble, I got, got another one for you. 
Okay. Um, what is one thing that if you did this growing up is an automatic butt whooping? Yeah, that was lying. <laughs> mm. My daddy, my daddy would be beating my butt and he'd say, you know, this hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but well, stop doing it. But he'd say, I'm beating you because you lied to me. If you just told me the truth, it wouldn't have been as bad. Wow. And um, and he taught me, we, we had a little system where I got in trouble and, and he didn't know about it yet. I could come to him and he said, daddy, can we have a man to man talk? And uh, then I have to go ahead and confess about whatever it was I did. And I quickly found out that it was much better for me to do that, particularly if I thought they were going to find out anyway. Uh, if I thought I could get away with it, but, you know, I'd keep my head down and try to get away with it. Yeah. But um, uh, what, what he said was, I'm not going to promise that I won't punish you if you come and tell me the truth. He said, but I promise you this, it's going to be much, much worse if you lie to me. Mm. That's what got me in trouble. Yeah. Well, let me tell you. Right away, lying to my dad. Or my mom, as the case may be. Yes, sir. I think I'm going to take that and put that in my uh, parenting toolkit whenever the time comes. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so we're, we're going to move over to our signature question. Um, a question we ask all of our guests. It's, it's a fan favorite. Okay. What, do you, what do you love the most about life while Black? I love the, the culture. Mm. I love the culture. Talk about it. Nothing right. like it. You see, just just about everybody here in the country is black that is African American. And of course, a lot of people have come from other places. Mm -hmm. But the overwhelming majority of black folks can trace their roots back to the South. Because most of us came here through Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah. Slave market, you know. Uh, and and I grew up in South Carolina. And, and there's just something about being black, being uh, from the South or having those Southern roots. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you can run across families up in the North, been up there a couple of generations, but they still got those Southern roots, you see. Yes. And they'll have, oh yeah, I got relatives down in South Carolina or Alabama or Mississippi or whatever. Doesn't matter where they are, New York, California, Michigan or whatever. Yep. And, 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 and so when you, when you take that culture, you know, the food, everybody likes Southern cooking. Yeah. Uh, or if you hear music, you know, you hear a beat, you just kind of fall in with it, you know? Yep. Yep. And, yep. And, and, and that's what I like about being black. All right. So we're going to move over to our focus quote. Okay? okay. So here it is. No work is insignificant. All labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and importance and should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Captain T, what does this quote mean to you? Oh, I, I, I got a quote that's even better from Dr. King along the exact same line. Oh, wow. It's right down to it. It says, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted, mm -hmm. or Beethoven composed music, or Shakespeare, wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweep who did his job well. well That's from Dr. King as well. Yes, sir. Same line. And that means do your best no matter what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Every time. Each and every time. Yes, sir. And in, in, in that was the environment that I grew up in, yeah. influenced by Dr. King. And it's what, to a great extent, Flight to Excellence is all about, my book. Yes, sir. And, and here's the thing. You see, each of us can do the best that we can. Now, I might not be able to do the best that you can or that somebody else I'm looking at can, but I can do the best that I can. Right. See? And that's something that each and every one of us can do. Right. And it no. doesn't take any special skills or talents to do the best that you can. Yes, and here's sir. the deal. If you do that, you're going to do better than most. Mm. Because most people are not going to give you their best. Yes, sir. Because most people aren't committed to excellence. Right. And that's my definition of excellence. Right. Doing the best that you can each and every time.
Yeah. Wow. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, we um sort of chose Martin Luther King as the focus because to uh to my understanding, you actually got to meet Dr. Martin Luther King, right? That's true. Could you sort of tell the audience about that experience and, and sort of how anything from that conversation that you had with Dr. King sort of shaped the uh, trajectory of your career or your work ethic? Well, I grew up in a small Southern town, Orangeburg, South Carolina, back when segregation was still the law of the land. Mm -hmm. And Orangeburg was an activist little Southern town because it's got two HBCUs in it, South Carolina State College, or South, South Carolina State University today, it's called college back in the day, and Claflin University. And they're right next door to each other. And so, even though it was a small Southern town, because of uh, the colleges you had, I, was, I would use the term of black intelligentsia, you know, the, the doctors, PhD types were taught at the universities. And you had kids coming in from all over the country uh, to go to school there. And so there were quote unquote rules about living in the South, the segregationist rules, but you know, kids coming from New York or out West or whatever, weren't um, respectful of those rules, like maybe some local folks were. Right. And so the, the campuses tended to be um, a petri dish for agitation. And as a, as a young uh, black kid growing up in Orangeburg, I had an uncle who was a professor up at uh, the college and my dad had worked up there. Both my parents went to school there and graduated. Um, but so I was very connected with the college. And so we were very influenced by what the college kids were doing, even, you know, as we were younger at the beginning of the civil rights movement. And so from about 1960, pretty much until I left to go to the academy, there was always something going on in Orangeburg. Yeah. Either a civil rights march or a demonstration or a boycott or picketing or something. And in fact, I got arrested the first time when I was 12 years old. Wow. Um, didn't, didn't go to jail. I was sitting in front of the cop. And he said, you know, he, head down, he's filling out form back in those days, but with pencil and pen. He said, date of birth. And I gave my date of birth. He looked up. He said, you live in Orangeburg? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> so he said, give me, give me your dad's phone number. So he called my father up. He said, Mr. Thompson, would you come out here and get your son? Right. So I didn't get I didn't get to go to jail, even though I'd been arrested uh, with a group of about a thousand other college kids for the most part. Right. But I did go to jail when I was 14. And that was the summer before going to Orangeburg High, where I uh, joined 12 other African-American kids who were integrated in Orangeburg High. And uh, that summer, 1965, summer 65, the Civil Rights Act was about to be passed and we were getting people registered to vote. And uh, at the time, you could only vote, you could only register to vote two days out of the year. Uh, this was in August at the Orangeburg County Courthouse. Right. And we were out getting people to come in and register to vote. And the first day, uh, we registered over 600 people and the white power structure got, got scared. Wow. They had three registrars on the first day. Second day, they only had one. <laughs> said that one guy was sick and the other guy had a cow in a ditch he had to get out. And so uh, our leader at the time, a guy who was working for SCLC, uh, a paid worker, mm -hmm. SCLC was the organization that Dr. King founded, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I was in the teenage division at the time. Okay. Told, told the powers that be that, that we were gonna stay in the courthouse until they had three registrars working eight hours, eight hour shift. You know, they, they needed to register these people to the boat. We had a long line of black folks. Well, five o'clock came, they said the courthouse was gonna close. Mm -hmm. And that if we didn't leave, we were gonna be arrested for trespassing on government property. So we all went down to the courthouse. Not, I say we all, kind of the cadre, the people who were SCLC folks. Some of the people who had come to register, but most of them went home and they closed the courthouse up. Told everybody to go home. But, kind of hardcore group we went down to the main courtroom and we started singing freedom song for about an hour or so and then they came in and said you know cops are on the way folks don't get out of here y'all going to jail 
and we all went to jail. So that wow. was the, the second time I was arrested. But that was the, the, the sense of Orangeburg. So Dr. King came in um, 1964 okay. and uh, to speak at a church right across the street from both of the colleges, Trinity Methodist Church. And, um, and at the time, you know, the, the movement had been going on for about four years since, like I said, 1960. Right. People were getting, people were getting kind of weary, you know, not much progress. A lot of folks getting arrested, going to jail. Money was drying up. My best friend's father was the treasurer for the NAACP. Mm -hmm. It was his job to go out and bail people out and, you know, they'd have to raise money to be able to do that. I'm sorry. And, uh, anyway, it was, you know, we weren't seeing a lot of progress and people were getting a little discouraged. And that's when Dr. King came to town to essentially uh, tell us that, you know, our cause was just, even though it was tough at the time, yeah. we were going to ultimately overcome. Just right. hang it in. Which things are going to get better. And wow. sure enough, uh, about eight months later, they passed the Civil Rights Act. Wow. And after that, the Voting Rights Act. Yeah. And, and, and I learned a lot from that experience of hanging in there because yeah. it was going to, it was going to be better. Yeah. And uh, so when, I mean, we were all jumping and celebrating when uh, President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Right. I reflected on Dr. King's words and, and yeah. on the fact that they were true. Just hang in there. We were going to overcome. Yes, sir. Perseverance, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes sir. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. So you you sort of gave us a great um, deal of uh, history regarding your upbringing. You sort of did a great job of painting the the uh, holistic picture of growing up in the uh, segregated South. So my question is, how does one go from growing up, you know, young black man, segregated South, you know, being arrested to having all of the prestigious positions that you've held? The big change, I think, or the big impetus was going to Orangeburg High. Mm. And even though that was a very uh, taxing and um, let's see, difficult process. There was another word I was thinking about, but you know, I'm getting older see now sometimes I lose, I lose track of the word I really want. You're fine, sir. Yeah, but even though it was difficult, um, it put me on a track that exposed me to some things that I never would have been exposed to had I gone to the black high school. I didn't know that there was an Air Force Academy. I had heard of Army and Navy before mm -hmm. because you know they're both on the East Coast. And, and, and they have the Army Navy football game every year. Mm. I didn't really know the intricacies of a service academy or what it was. Um, and so uh, being at Orangeburg High uh, put me in a position to, to get exposed to those things. Uh, yeah. and, and so I learned about West Point, what it was, and Naval Academy. I learned that there was an Air Force Academy. Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, it, it created for me an opportunity that I probably would not have gotten had I gone to the Black High School. Yeah. And going to the academy, in fact, uh, I was the first African-American from South Carolina to go to the Air Force Academy. Yeah. Once again, exposed me to things that I would never have even in, in a million years growing up in South Carolina expected that I would have an opportunity to be exposed to. Yes, sir. When I came out as a cadet, and this was for every cadet at the time, our first summer there, we all got a ride in the back seat of the T-33, yeah. which was the trainer, uh, jet trainer back in those days. Right. And it's like, whoa, I, you know, I can't believe it. I'm flying in a jet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that sort of thing, you know. And of course, four years at the academy, you get exposed to a lot of other things too. Right. Uh, you know, I, I I I jumped, so I got my jump wings. You know, got to travel a lot, uh, both uh, on hops and, of course, the program requires that you travel a lot. Still mm -hmm. does to some extent. Um, and so those kinds of things uh, paved the way, opened doors for me. Mm -hmm. And and the whole academy experience for me. And it, it was difficult, but in some ways, not as difficult as high school. 
because at least when you're at the academy, you're with your class, right? Right. You bond and you do things together as a class and you get through, uh, through BCT as a class in the first year and, you know, re uh, recognition and all that sort of thing. Right. And so you have, you're not isolated. You have that, you all have that common experience of going through something tough and, uh, and accomplishing it together. Mm -hmm. But at Andre High, you know, it was just out of 1,200 students, it was just a handful of us at the time. Now, by the time I became a senior, it was better. Right. But, right. Um, so there was that isolation as well as catching all the crap that you were catching. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I took advantage of being at the academy. Um, I came with a mindset of, of experiencing as much as I could. In fact, uh, I can remember freshman year, my roommate was from California, uh, and he was a big skier, right? Yes. And he wanted to take me skiing. And, and of course, in South Carolina, you get an inch of snow, and that'll shut the state down for two days, right? Same would take. So my whole concept about snow in the South was very different than, than uh, it is in a lot of other parts of the country. And I said, nah, I ain't going up in no snow, man. He said, that. he said, it'll be great. You'll love it. He said, and you know, you're an athlete, athlete you, you'll be good at it. Right. I said, well, I don't know how to ski. He said, well, I used to be a ski instructor. I'll teach you. And I said, well, I don't have the right clothes. He said, we'll, we'll get you the right clothes. In fact, you'll, be, uh, you'll probably be so warm, you'll be taking stuff off. Right. And I said, well, I don't have no ski equipment. He said, there's a ski club. But that ski club, you can get your stuff for $5 and a discounted lift ticket. So he kept meeting all my objections and I finally had to give in. I thought, okay, what the hell, I'll try it once, right? Right. And I went up there with him. He taught me how to snow plow. We had a great time. It was just fabulous, fantastic. The, the scenery up there, looking out over the, the mountains. Right. And, 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 and I taught myself a lesson to don't put self-imposed limitations on myself. Wow. You know, to always be open to new experiences. Yes, now, sir. if I don't like it, I can always say, tried it, didn't like it, you know, I'm going to leave it behind. Mm -hmm. But don't put self-imposed limitations before you even know or understand what's going on. Yes, and sir. that was what my roommate taught me by taking me to go skiing. Yes. You, you and I have both been privileged mm. because uh, there are tens of thousands of people that want to get to a service account. Right. That's in the brightest in the land. And, 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 and most of them don't have a hope. And even the ones that are competitive that do have a chance, and that ends up being roughly about 10,000 a year for each school. Right. You know, only about 10% of that 10,000 get to come. You know, anywhere from a, depending upon what's going on in the Air Force and DOD with respect to budget, but it right. varies between roughly a thousand to about fourteen hundred kids a year. Yeah, get the opportunity to go to a service again. Right, and, and so uh, it is tough. It's meant to be tough, um, but it's the tough that makes it worthwhile. Yeah. Yes, sir. Tough that makes it valuable and makes you. If you can get out of it, one thing to get in, and then you got to get yeah. out. Too. You got to make. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So would you do it again if you if, if you woke up tomorrow and tomorrow was in processing day? Would you do the yes. academy again? You definitely in a heartbeat. In a in a heartbeat. heartbeat and I would do it better. Mm. Because I could have done it better. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I look back on it, I could have done it better. Yeah. Do you think do bad, but I could have done it better? Do and what 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 do you think um contributed to you uh not doing as good as you could have done? Do you think what it was because you were, you know, maybe in a culture shock, maybe you were in survival mode? What do you think it was? No, you just, you know, you get lazy sometimes. <laughs> you know, I could have studied harder. I mean, I did all right. Yeah. I, I wasn't, I wasn't super list entire. It wasn't until about, well, two things. Number one, I play football as well. Yeah. And so that, that takes, um, that takes a lot of time and effort. And quite frankly, um, you sometimes, and, and it doesn't apply to everybody, but you can sometimes get an attitude being a jock, right? In a service academy environment, yeah, um, and, and and you can use that as an excuse not to do some of the other things things that you should have supposed to be doing. Um, right. But I but I finally figured that out. Um, 
And, and so my two degree year, um, I kind of got myself together and I became first sergeant in my squadron. Back in those days, there was no superintendent in the squadron. So first sergeant was the, the highest position you could have in the squadron as a, right. as a union. Um, and then from that, from that point on, I, you know, I was tracking pretty good. I was on wing staff back then. There, there were only five positions on wing staff and we all lived together in three rooms down uh, where kind of where the Bobby shop and those offices are in, um, in the old dorm. Yeah. Uh, they're not, they're not all offices because they kicked the cadets, they kicked wing yeah. staff out. The yeah. rooms were so big and so nice that I guess they reclaimed it. But the wing commander had a room by himself, and then the yeah. other four of us shared, you know, two rooms. Yeah. And uh, and I was on wing staff twice my senior year. Wow. So I, I wasn't in the squadron much at all. Wow. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, and then uh, it, senior year, I was on soups list and all that. But I could have been on soup list, quite frankly. I could have been on soup list as a, as a freshman if yeah. I had really put my right. yeah. effort into it, you know. Yeah. But I was yeah. playing football. My first my first GPA was two point. 2.17. And I wow. remember Coach Bowman saying, well, you got 0.17 more than you need. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> wow. And so I kind of had that attitude, you know. Yeah. 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 I, I know uh, brother, brother Ed Hopkins and myself on this platform, we sort of talked about that uh that 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 two point and go mindset that they try to instill in you and how that's really toxic, especially yeah. for us as, yeah. as African Americans. Mm -hmm. um and that that expectation is so low um yes. you being on the other side having accomplished everything that you have thus far could you sort of speak to you because you, you know you, you have the cadets listening to you right now and the future cadets could you sort of speak to that 2.0 and go mindset and how toxic that is well it gets back to living a life of excellence right mm. doing the best that you can each and every time yes sir and 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 we all have issues and challenges in to deal with from time to time. I call it the dirty little four letter word, life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can't let the turbulence of life, because there's no way to get around that, but you can't let the turbulence of life keep you from achieving excellence in your life. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter how powerful you are, or how rich you are, everybody's got to deal with life. Yep. Jeff Bezos, richest guy in the world, right? Amazon. Well, he went through a divorce. He got caught messing around, very public, very embarrassing. The divorce cost him $38 billion, yeah. <laughs> making his ex-wife the fourth richest woman in the world. Wow. So even the richest guy in the world has got to go through stuff. Right? The most powerful guy in the world is the President of the United States. But whether it was Jimmy Carter, who, who didn't get elected for a second term, Ronald Reagan got shot, assassination attempt, um, Bill Clinton got impeached because he was messing around with Monica Lewinsky, Obama had the Great Recession to deal with. Uh, and, and Trump got impeached twice and didn't get reelected. So it doesn't matter who you are, what you got, power, money, whatever, you got to deal with life. But yes, you can't let the turbulence of life mm -hmm. keep you from achieving excellence in your life. Yes, sir. Excellence, turbulence, those are all terms that I remember in this book. Yes. I see you have a couple of copies back there. Hey, you got to self-promote. <laughs> hey, hey. Yes, sir. So could you... Uh, yourself. Who's going to, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I, I, I want to give you the floor here to sort of talk about your book, uh, The Flight to Excellence. To, why did you write this book? What is it? Who is it for? And sort of just talk talk about the, uh, the four Ps. It's a concept in the book that I think is really, really interesting. I want to give you the opportunity to give the audience a peek. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'm going to answer the question first of why I wrote the book. Uh, big picture, as you've mentioned before, I've been uh, blessed to have an interesting life. I've had some unique experiences. 
And some of those are really good stories. Uh, and over the course of my career, I from time to time used the story of an experience that I had to illustrate a point that I was trying to make, either in my business or when I was running the AOG or usually when I was in a leadership position of some sort uh, to make a point. And, and it was not uncommon for me to get feedback, say, you know, you ought to write a book one day about that. Man, that was a great story, great point. So that was part of it. But the real driving issue around excellence for me was because of just everyday little things, right? If you, and you'll find this out, uh, particularly, you, you got a house now, you said? Yes, sir. Okay. You got a problem at the house, right? Um, you want to have somebody come out and fix it. But what do they normally do? Somebody's going to give you a four hour window. Well, we can have somebody there from eight to 12, or do you want it from 10 to two or from <laughs> two to six? Yeah. I said, no, I want a time. I don't want to waste my whole day waiting around for the guy to show up. You got to do better than that. Right. That's just one example. I said, no, that's just a lack of excellence because you don't have to run your business that way. Granted on occasion, um, because of scheduling or unanticipated circumstances that come up, you know, somebody may run a little late, but hell, I'd rather you tell me you're going to be there at 10 and that you're running a little late and be there at 1030 than for me to have to be there from eight to 12, right? Right. I said, and so that to me was an issue of excellence because you don't have to run your business that way. And that to me is not excellence because you're wasting people's time. And I had several ex experiences kind of like that just in real life where companies had kind of defaulted to the easier position, right? Mm -hmm. And um, rather than doing the best they could to provide good customer service, and, and it just irritated me. And, and that was another reason I decided to write the book and focus on excellence. Yeah. Now, with respect to the point that you made, I have a, a system that I call the P4 system. And that's because each of the four components all begin with the letter P. And yeah, I know I get accused of not being very imaginative, imaginative but you know what? Sometimes simplicity is, uh, is the better way to go. Yeah. And so the four P's are principles, the first one, got to have the right principles and nothing else matters. And your principles have to be aligned. Yeah. We'll talk about that momentarily if you want to. The second P is people. You want to surround yourself with good people and in a professional sense, the right people. Mm -hmm. But if you're the, the boss, you got to be good to the people you need. Yeah. Third P is a plan. I call it a flight plan for obvious reasons. Right. When you take off, you got to know where you're going and you got to be able to chart a course that takes you to your destination. Right. And the fourth and final P is performance. Mm -hmm. You got to have a bias for action. You got to be motivated to do. You got to be able to perform. Exactly. And those are the four P's in the P4 system. Okay. Okay. So two, two questions. One, I do sort of want you to go a little deeper when you talk about principle alignment. And then, okay. then two, again, you have a plethora of experience. You've dealt with people, businesses. You've had a ton of success. Of, the, of those four Ps, which one has been the hardest to grasp for you or which one do you see people struggle with the most? Um, I don't know that anyone is difficult to grasp what I find, and it goes back to a statement I made before, that the implementation of the P4 system, for most people who have trouble, it, it is because of the dirty four-letter word, life. And, and I'll give an example. Um, I was talking to a guy one day, working for a company, wants to be his own bo boss, he wants to be an entrepreneur. But he's got a big mortgage on the house and he's got two kids in private school. Another guy's an entrepreneur I talked to one time. Uh, got a product that's going to blow up on the internet and things. But he's having pro problems raising the money, the capital to finance the deal. Mm -hmm. 
Another situation was a, a, a lady, Ivy League, educated, uh, sharp as a tack, mm -hmm. knows that she should be in the C-suite, but she's got an a-hole boss that's holding the back. All legitimate reasons, all different reasons, but as I said before, it boils down to one four-letter word, life. Everybody's got to deal with challenges in their life. But here's the deal. You can't let the turbulence of life keep you from achieving excellence in your life. You see, when, you, when you're out in the air, when you're up in the air, you're out over the ocean, and you have turbulence, something's going wrong, either in the cockpit or outside because of Mother Nature. You got to have a mindset of doing whatever you have to do to keep the airplane flying until you can get it safely on the ground. Because you can't pull over on the side of the road and say, oh man, life is tough today. Mm. You know? and, and that's a mindset It's uh, that, that we all have to develop and then master, in my view, to achieve any significant long-term success. Yes, sir. But most people will allow those, those uh, challenges in life to hold them back. But it's the mortgage on the house, or they can't raise the capital, or you know somebody's giving me a hard time, you know, and, and that becomes the reason or the excuse for not doing what you need to do, yeah, to achieve what you want to achieve. Man. Now on alignment, um, and, and that's back to principles. Um, principles is a word that's a uh, homonym. And a homonym is a word that's spelled the same, it sounds the same, but it can have different meanings. So for example, principles can be uh, your ethical standards, uh, your personal principles, right? Mm -hmm. But principles also defines those fundamental truths, those, uh, those common laws of life, yep. like gravity. If I pick a pencil up and drop it, it's going to fall. Doesn't matter what my personal principles are, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And so the challenge in life, or you build a life of excellence when your personal principles are in alignment with the fundamental principles of life. That's good. And that's my definition of alignment. And I can give an example. Um, have you ever heard of a lady by the name of Ann Shiver before? Ann Shiver. Ann Shiver. Most I've people haven't. Ann Shiver was a little Jewish lady who lived in New York City. She worked for the IRS as a tax auditor and never made more than $4,000 a year. Mm. Uh, she worked hard, she was smart, but she never got promoted because in those days, she was both a woman and a man's job and she was Jewish, so yeah. she was discriminated against. But she learned about the fundamental principles of money by auditing rich people's tax returns. And her personal principles were relative frugality. She was frugal. She lived in the same one bedroom apartment in New York City to the day she died. Now I'm sure rent control had a lot to do with that. Right. She was frugal and she believed in saving and investing. When she died in 1995, the lady who never made more than $4,000 a year had a portfolio worth $22 million. And wow. by the way, that would be $38 million in today's dollars. Yeah. And it was because her personal principles were in alignment with the fundamental principles of money. Compound interest, the rule of 72, the fact that the stock market goes up on average about 10% a year right. from its founding back in 1926. Mm -hmm. And so her personal, now if she was a spender and a consumer, then her personal principles would not have been in alignment with the yeah. fundamental principles of money. Yeah. But her personal principles were in alignment with those fundamental principles of money and it made her a multi, multi million. Right. And the fact is, anybody can do it. Mm. In fact, we were talking before, uh, before we started actually doing the, the show today. Yes, sir. And, and I told you, start saving and investing right now. Yes, sir. Because one day you go, hopefully you're going to be as old as I am. And you, you want to have millions in the bank. Yes, and sir. if you start now without being a rap star, without being an NBA player or NFL big contract, you can have that. 
Yes, sir. Just by aligning your personal principles with the fundamental principles of life. Yes, sir. And that applies to relationships. Mm -hmm. That applies to health and wellness. That applies to finances. If your personal principles are in alignment with the fundamental principles around those, those aspects of life, then you'll live a life of excellence. Yes, sir. That, that makes is, sense? No, that, that makes perfect sense. I caught it. I hope our audience catches it. And I hope everybody under the sound of my voice goes out and gets uh, Captain T's book. Uh, it's, it's out on Amazon. It's also, it's on your website too, is right? You can order it uh, from my website, captaintspeaks.com. Mm -hmm. uh, Amazon and um, uh, not Borders. What's the other one? Um, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble. Yeah, you can get it Barnes and Noble as well. Let's um, let's let's press because this next question that I want to ask you, it sort of encompasses a lot of things that we've talked about, especially regarding your your leadership philosophy, your philosophy on life principles, business, money, all of that, right? The summit group. Why did you start it? What is it? And yeah, sort of just go off a little yes. bit about the summit group. Gotcha. So I I went to law school. So I'm gonna have to take a step back. I went to law school, not because I wanted to be a lawyer, but because I wanted to have something to fall back on if I couldn't get an airline job. And when I went to law school, one of the things that I decided to do was to take several tax courses which were not required. They were elective courses at the time. And the reason I wanted to take the tax courses, I took tax one, started out taking tax one, was because I was single living in the BOQ and I'd always heard that owning a home was a good investment for taxes, both investment and taxes, but I didn't know why. And I guess I could ask my parents, but uh, you know, uh, they had somebody else do their taxes. I don't know if they, knew why either. They were both school teachers. They were not uh, savvy business folks or investors or anything, although they did very well. But um, so I took tax one and then I learned that, you know, interest that you pay on a loan, you can deduct uh, on your tax returns. And uh, I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. So in just about all the money you make on a mortgage payment is interest at the beginning. And so then I, I understood and so I thought, well, what, what else about taxes uh, are a good deal? And so I got deeper and deeper into it. Again, not because I wanted to go out and practice tax law, but just to educate myself. And it's amazing, man. The tax structure in the United States of America is how the government implements just about everything in your life through yep. the tax code. That, that is a discussion for another time, but in any respect. Um, and so because I was aware of, of tax law in a, in a specific way. When I got hired by Delta and did become a pilot, um, I decided to start a little business um, targeting airline pilots, tax sheltered investments on how they could save more money and keep more of the money that they had. Um, and I had a partner who was a hospital administrator. So he knew a lot of doctors. And uh, between he and his, you know, his contacts and, and, and my contacts, we had a, a, a good clientele for our services. So we started the business to do tax and financial uh, consulting for high net worth individuals. Um, and, and through that, and that was the summit group. That was the founding of the summit group. Yes. And I had a group of doctor clients who, uh, four of them, they were together in a group who were taking my advice on what they should do to uh, implement the strategy that we had talked about. And one of which was to buy more real estate. So they were gonna buy a little shopping center and they asked me if I wouldn't help them negotiate the deal for them. Uh, and I agreed to do that. And I took, uh, I took a percentage on the back end. That, that means after the building was owned for a number of years and sold it, then I would get yeah. My, uh, my fee. Uh, and that was good for them. And it was good for me at the time because I figured, you know, this would be an investment for the long term. Uh, and then as, as I negotiated the deal, I saw that it was uh, going to be a good deal. And so I asked them if I could invest in the deal with them. And they said, yeah, you know, buy whatever you can buy. 
percentage wise. And I went out and took five MasterCards and I maxed them out to get cash so that I could <laughs> jump into this deal. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I knew it's going to be a good deal because I was negotiating the deal. So I was negotiating a good deal. Yeah. And, and then, uh, and so they, they said, well, you know, we're doctors and you're an entrepreneur. Why don't you become the managing partner and deal with the tenants and the snow plowing and the trash and all that kind of stuff? And I said, okay, I'll do that if I get another percentage on the back end of the deal as well. So between my investment, my fee, being the managing partner and my compensation for doing that, no money up front, by the way, this is all on the back end, right? Uh, I ended up with about 30% of the deal. Wow. And, uh, and that deal ran for about two years and we flipped it and, and flipped it with uh, a, a close to $2 million profit. Mm -hmm. So I had like 500 and something thousand dollars, which was big money back, back then. It's big money today. Yeah. And, so, uh, and so I invested with these guys in a couple more real estate deals, but I started uh, doing other things as well and uh, got into fast foods, Subway. I had the first Subway in Boston, Dunkin' Donuts, TCBY yogurt, and uh, did some other things as well. I had uh, a systems integration company and and, and, and I had a, a, a method that I would, any deal that I did and I made money on, I lost money too. So it wasn't all perfect, but uh, I would invest half of it in a new deal. I would take a quarter of it and invest in the stock market. And I would take the last quarter, 25%, and I would upgrade my standard of living without debt. So if I you know, was gonna buy a new car, I'd buy a new car without financing it. But, yeah. but, but I never bought a new car, ever. I always bought a used car because yeah. I wasn't gonna take a 20% 20, 20 hit okay. <laughs> when you drive off the lot. Even, yeah. my, even my cadet car, all my classmates bought Corvettes. I bought one too, but I bought mine from a first <laughs> from the year before. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's how the summer group started and that's kind of how it grew and uh, you know, over time, we just kept looking at opportunities that presented themselves and uh, it made sense. I jump in. Right. Like I said, I had my winners and my losers, but uh, the right. winners uh, were more than the losers. So all in all, it turned out pretty good. What piece of advice would you give to um, young venture capitalists out here? Yeah, do your homework. Mm -hmm. uh, because even when you... Uh, do your homework and, and, and there are always things that are unanticipated that'll come along and can, uh, can set you back. Um, but that, that's life. Yeah. So do your homework. The other thing is have capital. Uh, yeah, I was in a bad deal. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I, had, had I not been with partners, I could have survived the deal quite, quite uh, easily. But because I had some partners that went bankrupt, ended up having to take, take over their share as well. And so that was a bit taxing. But because I had um, implemented that formula that I told you about before, mm -hmm. didn't have any debt, I had money invested in the deal, but that was tied up in a, a liquid. But yeah. because I had consistently put that other 25% in the stock market, I had resources you know, to help me get through tough times. Yeah. Um, and so always have cash. Cash is king. Yes, sir. Uh, e even if it's invested in not technically cash, but have it liquid so you can go on your computer these days and, yeah. uh, and, and liquidate some if you need some cash to help get you through tough times because there, there will be tough times. There always are. Um, so those would be the two big points. Do your homework and make sure you have some cash. Yes, sir. Do your homework. Make sure you have some cash. Got it. Taking notes. Taking notes. Um, yeah. So... Again, you've done a plethora of things in your career, lawyer, pilot, uh, businessman, entrepreneur, public speaker, author. Um, of all the things that you've accomplished in your career, which one do you cherish the most? Which accomplishment do you cherish the most and why? Uh, getting my wings. Mm. And for two reasons. Number one, I just enjoyed it. It was just a blast to go out there and fly jets, you know. In fact, I can remember my first solo in, in, in uh, T-37, sitting on the runway, 
and I'm yelling out and screaming to myself, oh, if the boys back home could see me now, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it, it distinguished me in a way from, particularly in the black community, from uh, pretty much other professionals, right? Because yeah. you know, you know a bunch of doctors, you know a bunch of lawyers. I walk in the room and I was a pilot, and there ain't a whole lot of black folks that knew a pilot, you know. Right. And um, and so it, now, um, I used to say because I was an instructor pilot in the Air Force as well that. You, you can teach just about anybody to fly if you got enough time. So the challenge with pilot training was not as much learning how to fly. Um, the challenge was to learn how to fly within the constraints, the budget constraints, they don't call it that, but you know, you got X number of rides and you got a solo. And if yep. you can't solo in 10 rides, they're gonna give you maybe one more practice ride and one more final check ride. And if you still can't solo after that, then you, you're gone. Yeah. Uh, and so the challenge was to do it within the time period, i.e. the monetary period, because the Air Force, they have a whole bunch of money to, to spend on you to, to get you to fly, you know, giving you as many flights as you want. Yeah. So that was the challenge of pilot training, to get it and get it quick. Yes, sir. Um, and, uh, and it, it, so those two reasons, number one, it, it made me unique, particularly in the black community. Uh, and, or it made me unique even in the white community as a black guy who could fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then when I became a lawyer, whew, I mean, it was like off the charts. Now these are other people's impressions of you and not necessarily right. my, my uh, ego about myself. In fact, yeah. For quite a while, I used to tell people, which, you know, I'm no different than anybody else that I went to law school with because everybody was in the evening program in, in, in my program. They had a day program and an evening program. And everybody, most people had another job during the day that they did and they went to law school at night. Right. So in that context, I was just like everybody else. Yeah. And then and, and being a pilot, I was just a pilot in the squadron like all my other fellow pilots, right? right. And so there was nothing unique about me in my day-to-day -day job with everybody else that was surrounding me because they were doing the same day-to-day -day job as well. So. Um, but people's perception of it um, and, and their view of it mm -hmm. was that it was just amazing. And right. I finally just had to buy into that, okay, that's the way they're gonna look at it. I may as well just go with the flow and maximize what I can get out of it. So yes, I stopped down playing it and I was just politely and gracious to say, well, well, thank you, I appreciate that, you know. Yes, and move on. Yeah. Um, and so, so that because I personally enjoyed just the, the physical activity and skill of being able to fly an airplane mm -hmm. and uh, and people's perception of it, I think uh, uh, you know has has given me a leg up in a in a lot of situations, even in business. Yeah. You know, uh, because of that uh, unique uh, ability. And so I, I would encourage, particularly cadets listening to me. I know a lot of um, folks these days, because it's a 10 year commitment, shy away from it. Uh, it was a five year commitment when I went through. And so I recognize that that difference, um, you know, is substantial. But in the scheme of things, uh, it's not that much time. And it will separate you from your compadres, whether you stay in, because even though the Air Force is not as pilot focused as it used to be, it's still a pilot Air Force. And yeah. I say that not to denigrate any other um, skill set. Right. It's just a fact. Look at, uh, look at the chief of staff, look at this, you know, the, the folks that are running the MAG comms, yep. you know, with few exceptions, they're all pilots. Yes, so sir. if you're gonna stay in and make it a career, then why not give yourself every advantage that you can? Yeah. If you get out and decide to do something else, then you know it's like being an academy grad. You'll always carry that with you. And if you're a pilot, you'll always carry that with you and people will be impressed with it. Even if you decide after that to get out and go to business school and do business and everything else. Yeah. If somebody says, you're, oh, you were a pilot? You were an Air Force pilot? No, oh, yeah. You, yeah. You, you get that wow factor, you know? And um, 
And so it's something that uh, I would highly advise right. given the opportunity because you only get it once. Yeah. You know, you know, if you don't take advantage of it, it it'll never come around again. So yeah. I would say regardless of what you're going to do. Uh, I mean, I got a classmate that became a pilot and went to med school, became a doctor afterwards. I became a pilot and went to law school, became right. a you know, lawyer afterwards. Uh, and, and, uh, and you can do that, but you can't do the other way around. You know, right. you can't go off and do something else and then try to be a pilot, you know, Air Force pilot. Yeah, 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 no, I got you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I would take advantage of it if, if you have that opportunity because it will open doors because of people's perception about pilots. See, most people don't know how an airplane flies or how it gets from point A to point B, especially if you can't look outside and see where you're going. Yeah. And so any, anytime I go to a cocktail party or something like that, and you know, what do you do? Well, I run a business summit group. Oh, okay, that's cool. I'm a lawyer and I fly for Delta. You're a pilot? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so uh, it just, it's got me on boards. It's got me into business deals just because of people's perception of it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Matt, wow. I, I hope every, um, every future cadet, uh, the cadets now, the parents watching and listening, I really hope you pay attention to what Captain T is saying here. Um, and I really hope you all tie it back to what he said at the beginning um, about his exposure to the United States Air Force Academy. The opportunities are endless. And once you get here, we got you. I'm talking about the long black and blue line. We got right. you. <laughs> yes, sir. So we're, we're going to wrap it up here. Before I let you go, I want to ask you two more questions, two of our signature ending questions. So give us one book recommendation that you would recommend to the audience. Well, I would have to recommend my book, <clears throat> The Flight to Excellence. You held it up, I'm gonna hold mine up as well. Okay, of but course. Assuming that you're talking about uh, a book other than that, it would be Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon wow. Hill. You know, if you look at this book, it is weathered because I've probably read it 15 times and I'm not exaggerating. Now. I don't necessarily subscribe to everything in the book, but it's kind of my Bible for life. Somebody exposed me to it a long time ago. In fact, that's, this is the old, you, you, you can't buy a copy like this. It's, it's yeah. all pretty up today. Thank you. Right. Yeah. yeah. But um, just the concepts of mastermind and uh, essentially a book about actions, doing your best and how you do that. And I follow yeah. Think and Grow Rich uh, for years. And, and it, when I was in business about every three or four years, I'd read it again. And I always got something, if not new out of it, it just reinforced something that I already knew and that maybe yeah. I'd forgotten and not focused on. And so, yeah, my book in Think and Grow Rich. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Awesome. I actually have Think and Grow Rich. I, rich. I got it as a gift. It's been collecting dust though. So I now need to pick that up and, uh, yeah, dust and, it off. And, get to it yes sir absolutely and then our final question for you captain t again you have the audience of everybody every black usafa alumni parents cadets and anybody else who's a fan of the way of life alumni group what is one final thought that you want to leave with everyone here's what i got out of the academy experience mm. and I, would, I would strongly urge everybody that has been exposed to it cadets that are there now, alumni. Um, the academy gives you a foundation for attaining the unattainable. Wow. Because you come out of that experience knowing that you can do things that you never thought you could do before. But because the academy experience, the academy forced you to do things. Whether it's going through the POW series, well, they, they call it SEER now. Yeah. Sear or just BCT, just all the things, you know, double E, aeronautical, <laughs> engineering, astro, you know, you get through stuff that you never thought that you'd be able to get through, but you get through it. Yeah. You come out of that institution knowing that you can attain the unattainable. 